friends, it's your teen and tween librarian Rebecca, and we're back for another episode of Bedtime Stories. Last time we saw Axel take a walk to really clear his head and think about the ideas the professor had given to him, and uh, he actually came across his lovely Verlandes Groeven, and surprisingly she was incredibly supportive of the idea. You think she would be concerned about sending off her fiancé to uh, climb down to the center of the earth through a volcano. But she was like, yeah, do it. And so it made me wonder just a little bit if she was like, finally got rid of this guy. But we'll find out later on in the story if that's if I'm just uh, blowing smoke here. Uh, but tonight we get to see Axel and the professor take the first leg of their journey to Denmark and then to Iceland. Um, and we get to little, learn a little bit more about Axel and the professor is the professor. <laughs> so let's enjoy chapter eight. Chapter eight, the first stage. Altona, which is almost a suburb of Hamburg, is the terminus of the Kiel Railway, which was to take us to the shores of the belts. In less than 20 minutes, we were in Holstein. At half past six, the carriage drew up outside the station. All my uncle's bulky parcels and articles of luggage were unloaded, carried in, weighed, labeled, and put in the luggage van. And at seven o'clock, we were sitting opposite each other in our compartment. The whistle sounded and the engine moved off. We were on our way. Was I resigned? Not yet. However, the cool morning air and rapidly changing scenery through which the train carried us took my mind off my chief preoccupation. As for the professor's thoughts, they were obviously far ahead of the train, which was much too slow for his impatient character. We were alone in the carriage, but neither of us said anything. My uncle examined all his pockets and his traveling bag with minute care. I saw that he had not forgotten a single one of the documents necessary for the execution of his plans. One of them was a carefully folded sheet of paper bearing the letterhead of the Danish Chancery and signed by Mr. Christensen, the Danish consul at Hamburg and a friend of the professor's. This was obviously intended to enable us to obtain at Copenhagen a letter of introduction to the governor of Iceland. I also noticed the famous document carefully tucked away in the innermost pocket of my uncle's wallet. I cursed it from the bottom of my heart and turned my attention once more to the countryside. It was a vast succession of uninteresting, monotonous, loamy, and fertile plains. Good railway country and very propitious for those straight lines so dear to railway companies. But I had no time to tire of this monotony, for three hours after our departure to the train stopped at Kiel, a stone's throw from the sea. As our luggage was registered for Copenhagen, we had no need to bother about it. All the same, the professor watched it anxiously as it was transferred to the steamer. There it disappeared into the hold. My uncle, in his haste, had made a mistake over the connection between train and steamer, so that we had a whole day to spare. The steamer, Eleonora, was not due to sail until nightfall. This resulted in a feverish nine hours during which the irascible traveler heaped curses upon the steamship and railway companies and the governments which allowed such abuses. I had to back him up when he complained to the captain of the Eleonora on the subject. He wanted him to get up steam straight away. The captain sent him packing. At Kiel, as elsewhere, a day goes by somehow or other. By dint of strolling along the grassy shores of the bay on which the little town stands, of roaming through the thick woods which make it look like a nest in a tangle of branches, of admiring the villas, each provided with its little bathing house, and finally, of hurrying along and cursing, we came at last to 10 o'clock. Wreaths of smoke were now rising into the sky from the Eleonora's funnel. The deck was trembling with the throbbing of the boiler. We were on board and the temporary occupants of two berths in the only cabin. At a quarter past 10, the ropes were cast off and the steamer glided away over the dark waters of the great belt. It was a dark night, 
There was a smacking breeze and a high sea. A few lights on shore appeared in the darkness. Later on, I don't know where, a flashing lighthouse sent out a sparkling light over the waves. And this is all I can remember of that first crossing. At seven in the morning, we land at Corsur, a little town on the west coast of Zealand. There we changed from boat to another train, which carried us across a countryside just as flat as the plain of Holstein. It took us another three hours to reach the Danish capital. My uncle had not slept a wink all night. In his impatience, I believe he had been trying to push the train along with his feet. At last, he caught sight of a stretch of water. The sound, he cried. On our left, there was a huge building, which looked like a hospital. That's a lunatic asylum, said one of our traveling companions. Good, I thought. That's just the place for us to end our days in. Although big as it is, it couldn't be big enough to contain all Professor Liedenbrock's madness. Finally, at 10 in the morning, we alighted at Copenhagen, where the luggage was loaded onto a carriage and taken with us to the Phoenix Hotel in Bredgod. This took half an hour, for the station is outside the city. Then, my uncle, after a hasty toilet, carried me off with him. The hotel porter could speak German and English, but the polyglot professor questioned him in good Danish, and it was in good Danish that the man directed him to the Museum of Northern Antiquities. The curator of this curious establishment, whose marvels would make it possible to reconstruct the country's histories by means of its old stone weapons, its cups, and its jewels, was a savant called Professor Thompson, a friend of the Danish consul at Hamburg. My uncle had a cordial letter of introduction to him. As a general rule, one savant receives another rather coolly. But here was not the case. Professor Thompson was extremely obliging and gave a warm welcome to both Professor Liedenbrock and his nephew. I need scarcely say that our secret was kept from the worthy curator of the museum. We were simply disinterested travelers who wished to visit Iceland out of idle curiosity. Professor Thompson placed himself entirely at our disposal, and we scoured the keys in search of a ship leaving for Iceland. I hoped against hope that there would be no means of transport whatsoever, but I was disappointed. A little Danish schooner, the Valkyrie, was due to set sail for Reykjavik on the 2nd of June. The captain, Mr. Bjarn, happened to be on board. His future passenger was so overwhelmed with joy that he squeezed his hands until the bones almost broke. The good man was somewhat taken aback at this hand clasp. To him, it seemed a very simple matter to go to Iceland, since that was his trade, but to my uncle, it was sublime. The worthy captain took advantage of this enthusiasm to charge us double the usual fare, but we did not trouble our heads over such trifles. Come aboard on Tuesday at seven in the morning, said Captain Bjorn, after pocketing a respectable number of dollars. We then thanked Professor Thompson for his help and returned to the Phoenix Hotel. Things are going very well, very well indeed, said my uncle. What a stroke of luck to find the boat ready to sail. Now let's have some breakfast and see the sights of Copenhagen. We went to Kongen's Nye Tor, a square where there were two innocent-looking cannons which could not frighten anybody. Close by, at number five, there was a French restaurant where we had an ample breakfast for the modest sum of four marks each. After that, I took a childish pleasure in exploring the city. My uncle let me take him with me, but he saw nothing, neither the insignificant royal palace nor the pretty 17th century bridge which spans the canal opposite the museum, nor the huge memorial to Thorwaldsen, covered with hideous mural paintings and containing some of the sculptor's works, nor the toy-like castle of Rosenborg and its rather fine park, nor the magnificent Renaissance stock exchange with its spire made of the twisted tails of four bronze dragons, nor the big windmills on the ramparts, whose huge arms filled out in the sea breeze like the sails of a ship. What delightful walks we should have taken together, my pretty Virlandaise and I, beside the harbor where the two deckers and the frigates slept peacefully, along the green banks of the strait, and under the shady trees among which the fort is hidden, with its guns poking out their black muzzles between the branches of alder and willow. 
But alas, Groibin was far away, and I doubted if I would ever see her again. However, my uncle remained blind to these delightful scenes. He was very much struck by a certain church spire on the island of Amak, which forms the southwest district of Copenhagen. I was instructed to make in that direction, and we accordingly embarked on a little steamer which plied on the canals. A few minutes later, we reached the dockyard quay. After walking along a few narrow streets in which convicts wearing gray and yellow trousers were working under the supervision of Warden, we arrived in the Four Frelsers Kirk. There seemed to be nothing remarkable about this church, but there was one feature of its tall spire which had attracted the professor's attention. Starting from the top of the tower, an exterior staircase wound round the spire, circling up into the sky. Let's go up, said my uncle. But we may get dizzy, I retorted. All the more reason why we should go up. We have to get used to it. All the same. Come along, I tell you. We're wasting time. I had to obey. The caretaker, who lived at the other end of the street, let us have the key, and the ascent began. My uncle went ahead, climbing nimbly. I followed him with a certain trepidation, for I had no head for heights. I possess neither the equilibrium of an eagle nor its steady nerves. As long as we were shut inside the interior staircase, all was well. But after a hundred and fifty steps, the air struck me in the face and we had reached the top of the tower. There the aerial staircase began, protected by a thin iron rail and with narrowing steps which seemed to rise into infinite space. I can't do it, I exclaimed. You aren't a coward, are you? Come on, replied the pitiless professor. I had to follow him, clinging to the rail. The keen air made me dizzy. I could feel the spire swaying in every gust of wind. My legs began to give way. Soon I was climbing on my knees, then on my belly. I shut my eyes, suffering from space sickness. At last, with my uncle dragging me up by my collar, I reached the ball at the top of the spire. Look, he said, and look hard. You must take lessons in abysses. I opened my eyes. I saw the houses looking as if they had been squashed flat by a fall in the midst of the smoke fog created by their chimneys. Over my head, wisps of cloud were passing, and by an optical illusion, they seemed to be, to be motionless, while the spire, the ball, and I were being carried along at a tremendous speed. Far away on one side there was the green country, and on the other the sea was sparkling under a sheaf of sunbeams. The sound stretched away to the point of Elsinore, dotted with a few white sails like seagulls' wings, and in the mist to the east the faintly blurred coast of Sweden was still visible. The whole of this vast spectacle spun round beneath my eyes. Nonetheless, I was compelled to get to my feet, stand up straight and look around. My first lesson in vertigo lasted an hour. When at last I was allowed to come down again and walk on the solid paving stones in the streets, I could scarcely stand upright. We'll do that again tomorrow, said the professor. Sure enough, for five days in succession, I repeated this vertiginous exercise. And in spite of myself, I made decided progress in the art of lofty contemplation. And that's the end of chapter eight. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Bedtime Stories. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to the library's YouTube channel. You can also find out what's happening at the library by visiting us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Or you can always just go to the library's website. I hope to see you again for the next episode of Bedtime Stories, but until then, be well and sleep well. Thank you.